Okay, so I'm going to talk about menopause basics, as it were. Um, it's great that you're all here, and it sort of is a lovely finish to our Australasian Menopause Society meeting, which began with uh, a what we call a pre-Congress update on uh, early menopause on Friday morning. And we've had, uh, since Friday afternoon till lunchtime today, a very effective and uh, very interesting uh, meeting. So I'm going to outline, it just takes my glasses a few minutes to uh, be able to focus on the screen down here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the facts about the symptoms, uh, about self-management, and then about uh, therapies. And you've already heard from Sonia about heart and bones. And you'll be pleased to feel that there's some cool air coming in. <laughs> I've already uh, disrobed a little bit um, from the clothes that I had on when I came in this morning. I was here at 7. 30 and it was still quite cool and I thought it was going to be a winter day because I really didn't check the, the weather forecast. So I'm all dolled up in my, my, my warm gear still. Now, let's look at menopause, facts, symptoms, self-management. So we all know that uh, menopause for most of us is a natural life event. It happens uh, around the age of 51 and the definition of menopause is that it is our final menstrual period. That's the medical definition, the last period we have in our reproductive years. So that when a woman has stopped her periods, then she has had her menopause. But it's a retrospective diagnosis. So we can't say that we've had our final period until it's 12 months since the previous one. So it takes us 12 months to sort of diagnose it, really. However, there are those women who, have, who go through premature menopause, either spontaneously or uh, because of surgery where their ovaries are removed. And there are certain uh, states where perhaps the menopause might come on earlier. So, for example, we've heard about the problems of smoking. In fact, women who smoke have a slightly earlier menopause than those uh, women who don't smoke. Women who have a hysterectomy but have their ovaries retained may have an earlier menopause up to four years before the onset of her natural menopause. So most of us become menopausal between 45 and about 57, but the, the mean age is around 50, uh, 51. Now, there are 20% of women who just stop their periods and don't have any symptoms at all and they're the lucky ones. But most of us will have mild to moderate symptoms, and then 20% will have very severe symptoms that really impact on quality of life. And in our Caucasian community, the major symptoms that we women experience are what we call the vasomotor symptoms, the hot flushes, the night sweats, and along with those, insomnia, tiredness, lack of concentration, forgetting words. And I always tell this story that um, when my children were still teenagers, they're now adults, um, I was taking them to school one morning and I came out, it was early spring, and I said, look at that beautiful tree. And I couldn't remember what sort of tree it was. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do anything to see if I can recall the name of this tree. And it took me 36 hours to remember it was a magnolia tree. <laughs> so I always remember that. Some of you may have heard it before. Um, so, however, we also, one of the most other common group of symptoms are aches and pains. Aches and pains occur in almost 50% of women and is a symptom of the menopause. But interestingly, in women of Asian background, doesn't matter what, what part of Asia, 
Aches and pains seem to be a much more common first symptom along with insomnia and mood changes, whereas Caucasian women are more likely to have hot flushes and sweats as a first group of symptoms and then the aches and pains afterwards. But unfortunately, many of us will get dryness of our vagina, loss of lubrication with intercourse, painful sex, urinary frequency. We all have to dash off to the toilet as soon as we put the key in the door. And our pelvic floor muscles go a bit weak. They go even weaker if you haven't been doing your pelvic floor exercises throughout your reproductive years. And then these are the main symptoms that women will get. And of course, if you're in that 20% of group, you may in fact get more mood changes, particularly if you're not sleeping, if you're being woken up every few hours with the sweating and flushing, particularly if the flushing and sweating is severe and you have to get up, go to the bathroom, lay on the floor, have a shower, do whatever you need to do to cool down. So there's that great sense of uh, diminished well-being. Now, in the perimenopause, and that's the time around the change, so it's, it's from the time that our, well, the marker that we use is the time in which our periods actually start to change. But there will be some group of women who will continue to have regular periods, and then just one day they'll stop. The majority of us will notice that our periods get less and less frequent and perhaps less and less flow. And then there's a third group of women in whom the periods will become much more irregular, they can become heavy, they can become painful, there can be an increase in premenstrual symptoms, there may also be evidence of the hot flushes and the sweats as well. Now, there was some very interesting work done in, started in the 1930s in uh, the USA by a researcher called Trelaw. And he asked a group of 15-year-old women to chart their periods, so to write down the first day of each of their periods and how long they went for. And that research is still going on in the grandchildren of those original women. And what they found from that data was that they could see that irregular periods in the perimenopause were on an average for about four to six years before the final menstrual period. But the transition could be as short as one year and as long as 10 years. But most of us go through that time over about four to six years. I think in a lot of us, we don't actually realise that we're in that transitional phase. The only thing that we can notice is that we're actually the right age. Now, we have focused uh, quite a bit uh, in our conference on uh, early menopause. And early menopause is very important obviously for the women who are experiencing early menopause, but it's also a very important diagnosis that doctors need to have in the back of their brains when young women come presenting to them with irregular periods or having stopped the periods or if the periods are coming infrequently. There are many other causes that can be for changing periods at a young age. But one of the things we have to keep in our heads as doctors is that early menopause is one of what we call the differential diagnoses. Early menopause is defined as the period stopping before the age of 45. Premature menopause is defined as the period stopping before the age of 40. That can happen spontaneously. Um, it can happen because of chemotherapy or uh, surgery. So say, for example, if a young woman has severe endometriosis, where the lining cells of the uterus grow at sites inside the pelvis, on the ovaries, on the tubes, on the lining of the uh, inside of the abdomen, the peritoneum. 
Some women will have such severe endometriosis, may have multiple surgical procedures, but still have chronic pain and sometimes will persist in having active and aggressively active endometriosis. And in those young women, they may end up having to have what we call a pelvic clearance. It sounds terrible, but it means to take out a woman's uterus and also her ovaries and tubes, which will render that young woman uh, menopausal. Now, women who go through an early menopause will have the same symptoms that women have when they go through menopause at the expected time, but often the symptoms are much more severe, particularly in those women who have a sudden onset of the menopause, like women who've had their ovaries out, or women who have certain types of chemotherapy where the periods will, the, the, the chemotherapy is quite toxic and so it will affect the ovaries fairly suddenly. Now, in women who go through early menopause, they need, unless there is a contraindication, hormone replacement therapy until they are 50. Because young women who go through early menopause are at risk of developing osteoporosis and heart disease at an earlier age, than women who go through expected age of menopause. They are at increased risk of earlier onset of dementia, of cognitive impairment, and also, interestingly, of Parkinsonism. So for young women, it is very important for them to have hormone therapy, just as if they'd become diabetic and required insulin, or if their thyroid gland became underactive, they would require thyroid hormone and insulin for the rest of their lives. With regards to the young women, we recommend it until the age of expected menopause. But that doesn't mean to say that, in fact, uh, the symptoms are going to disappear at that time. And that I've just said all that. So I've talked all about that as well. The most important part of perimenopausal bleeding patterns are that we are now starting to see an increase in the rates of cancer of the lining of the uterus in the perimenopause. And there are two reasons for that. One is that during the perimenopause, we may not ovulate as regularly. And if women have more and more cycles that are anovulatory, that means that we don't have the balance of the oestrogen and the progesterone. So oestrogen hormones are produced by the ovary throughout the cycle all the time. Progesterone is primarily re uh, released after ovulation. And it is the progesterone that stops the stimulation of the lining of the uterus that oestrogen causes. So naturally, oestrogen stimulates the growth of our lining and then when we ovulate, the egg pops out of the ovary and the progesterone then stops the growth and makes the lining quite nutritious, expecting that a pregnancy will take place. And of course, as you know, that if it doesn't take place, you have a period. Now, there are the changes that can happen in that perimenopause where women cannot ovulate as much. So the lining can get thicker and thicker and what we say is long-term unopposed oestrogen, so that's where there's just an oestrogen stimulus, it predisposes to thickening of the lining of the uterus and an increased risk of um, endometrial cancer. Along with our increasing rates of obesity and being overweight, that has added another factor to the increasing risk and incidence of endometrial cancer in our community. The other thing just to throw in in the opposite direction is some recent research from uh, colleagues in Sydney have shown that women in the perimenopause can actually ovulate twice in a cycle in the perimenopause, not at other times, but in the perimenopause. So a woman may ovulate naturally mid-cycle and then two weeks later, when she's about to have her period, she may ovulate at the time of her period. So 
most women think that you're protected. You're not going to get pregnant when you're bleeding because you don't ovulate at that time, but you do. So that may be one of the reasons that we hear the story of the menopausal baby. Uh, from uh, We talked about our mothers might have had a child in their late 40s or something, and they say, oh, it was a menopausal baby. That's probably the reason from that particular uh, work. So that means that women who are in the perimenopause still need contraception up until the age of menopause, that is 12 months past their final menstrual period, if they are over 50, but two years after their final menstrual period, if they are under 50. So there is the possibility of those two things happening, the risk of endometrial cancer, but also the risk of um, double ovulations. And when that second ovulation happens, women will get the symptoms of both Estrogen production, so sore breasts, premenstrual symptoms that are out of proportion to where you think you are in your cycle. At the same time, the next couple of days, you may start having flushes and sweats. So that's the reason, is the high levels of hormones. And in the perimenopause, don't go asking your doctor to do your blood levels, because you might be ovulating one day and you may have a menopausal level a day or two later. So it means nothing in terms of where you are. There is no test that will tell you when your final menstrual period is. Don't let anyone tell you there is, because there isn't. There we have a, a journey that we all take. Some people's journey, as we've heard, is truncated at different times. So how do we manage ourselves? Well, you've heard from Sonia about being fit and healthy, and really that's what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on our lifestyle, our exercise, and healthy eating, and not too much healthy eating. Um, when we go to congresses, it's always too much healthy eating, um, but we did have a big birthday party last night because our society is 25 years old. <coughs> And Sonia is our number one dancer. She's been watching all those dance programs and uh, we had a fantastic birthday party. So we have been trying to combine food and, and diet and exercise and also using our brains and that's really important for us. Um, emotional well-being, I think is, is really important for us to think about I am always in awe of the stress and the life circumstances that women live under and how they manage incredibly well. And I think that one of the things that we need to take a little bit of time out when we get to the menopausal age is actually to give ourselves a bit of a pat on the back and to take time for ourselves. And that means not being at everybody's beck and call. I always remember a patient many years ago, I can't remember the patient, but I remember her telling me that her mother used to have Friday morning off. And Friday morning was mum's morning. Nobody ever found out where mum went. <laughs> and she died not telling anybody. So they never knew whether she was having an affair whether she was just going and sitting in a park or whether she went to a movie or, and nobody ever saw her. But Friday morning was mum's morning. What a sensible woman she was and she was generations ahead of herself. So time to yourself, even if it's just thinking time, but time that you turn your phone off, don't, don't trouble me, no phone calls, no computer, no nothing, just have time to yourself. It might be going and having a cup of coffee with friends or a lunch or even just sitting in the park for half an hour or a couple of hours. But do take time for yourself. That is really, really, really important. And if you're having major menopausal symptoms, then you have to look at how they're impacting on your quality of life. You have to think about what your stresses and circumstances are and whether you really need to have any form of therapy. 
Some women will want to try across-the-counter therapies or alternative therapies um, or herbal remedies. Other women will uh, find that, in fact, the only thing that's going to work is hormone replacement therapy, particularly if they've got severe symptoms. But then there are those women who can't take hormones and they may be then at a diff in a difficult uh, situation where we can't use hormones and we have to try other non-hormonal prescriptive therapies. So these are some of the self-management strategies. You're here to learn and to hear about the menopause. That's the most important thing. Expectation is usually worse than experience in the main and that once you have knowledge and the fact that most of us don't have too difficult a time, but 20% of them will have a difficult time, may help to ease some of the concern. And we always have to remember that everybody's experience is individual. What my experience has been is not what your experience will have been or is going to be. So what do we do? We get a cooler environment. Thank you, Janet, for organising for the air conditioning to come on. Um, we may layer our clothes, take them off, make sure that we can strip and then put them back on again. Having a little facial spray in your handbag. Uh, there are some water sprays that you can get that have a fine mist. Just have one in your handbag and whenever you get the hot flush, you can spray your face. Have some cool water with you. I have one uh, patient who uh, had breast cancer and her flushes were appalling. And she had a little fan just above her steering wheel so that every time the hot flash uh, started, she could flip the switch on the steering wheel fan and it would blow on her face and ease herself uh, till it came through. Now, there, there are certain things like paced respiration. You know the breathing that we do in labour? So you breathe into a contraction and then breathe down out of the contraction. Well, it's a bit like that. You can pace your respiration into the peak of the flush and then uh, ease it down as the flush eases off. That sometimes does help. Certain things like mindfulness therapy um, can be of help. And uh, also there are some uh, psychological biofeedback techniques which have been used for some people. Um, it's important you can reduce flushes by moderate exercise, stopping smoking, and uh, women who are overweight tend to have more severe flushes than women who are uh, thinner. So losing weight can also help to reduce the severity. You know what triggers will uh, increase your, your flushing and sweating. Caffeine's a great one. I find that always after a good cup of coffee you get a hot flush and I think, oh, it's such a nice cup of coffee. But uh, Alcohol is another great one. Anxiety is probably one of the, the most, uh, uh, one of the best triggers for a hot flush, particularly when you're uh, wanting to appear calm, cool and collected um, and uh, suddenly you get really hot and sweaty and your pulse rate goes up and you get quite anxious and you forget what you're going to say. So reducing caffeine and alcohol is very important and acupuncture is one of the latest uh, areas that is being researched at the moment and um, our uh, Gene Hale's research unit is involved with a study on acupuncture and hot flushes. So that's going to be interesting what those results are. At the present moment, most of the studies are quite mixed in their results. Some women find it helpful, but some women don't find it helpful at all. Now, when we look at the prescriptive therapies, it really becomes an informed decision, but it should be an informed decision about whether it's a prescriptive therapy or it's an across-the-counter product. And most of the stuff that you hear doesn't actually have any scientific proof. And there's one discussion we had during one of our sessions was about the placebo response. So it doesn't matter what you take, 
a certain percentage of women will have a significant reduction in their symptoms. And that's across the board, not just for flushing and sweating. It can happen across the board in medi many medical conditions. So maybe a lot of the cross-the-counter products actually are more a placebo effect than actually a pharmaceutical, a pharmacological effect. In other words, to do what, with what the actions of the uh, herbs or remedies actually do. So we need to, you need to know about whether it's prescriptive or non-prescriptive. Some of the medications that we use in the perimenopause can be the pill, a low dose pill in women who are fit and healthy with no cardiovascular risk factors such as high blood pressure, smoking, um, being overweight, having a very strong family history of uh, heart attack or stroke uh, under the age of 50. The best, uh, and then we, we can also use other medications with some of the oestrogens that we have in, uh, for hormone therapy uh, with one of the IUDs, the Marina IUD. Some of you may have, have them or have experienced them or know about them. Uh, that's an IUD that releases a very low dose of progestin and it acts as the progesterone or progestin to protect the lining uh, with taking the oestrogen. Now hormone therapy has been studied since the 1970s with what we call placebo controlled studies and they are randomised controlled trials. The biggest one you all heard about 10 years ago and in fact it was a study not looking at women who had symptoms and not looking at women who were around the age of menopause. Sonia presented data from a new study which has yet to be published but was presented at the recent North American Menopause Society showing in fact that there was no increase in uh, the cardiovascular risks uh, or cancer risks after four years, is that correct? So that's great news for those of us who are in the menopausal years and still symptomatic. Then there are those women who don't, uh, who are not able to take hormone therapy or don't choose to. There are some prescriptive therapies that we use. There are a group of the antidepressants which has been found to reduce flushing and sweating. Uh, there is one of the um, blood pressure medications, clonidine, it's been around for a long time. When I first uh, was involved in setting up the clinic uh, at Queen, the old Queen Vic Hospital uh, in uh, Lonsdale Street, the first line choice we had was a very low dose of clonidine, which has now gone off the market. And the third group of medications that we've been using um, is in fact gabapentin. And gabapentin is a medication for epilepsy or chronic pain. And that has also been shown to be effective in reducing uh, flushing and sweating. So they're the group, they're the broad group of medications which we use as prescriptive therapies. Now, oestrogen will alleviate the symptoms. So oestrogen is for the flushing and sweating, for the dry vagina, uh, for bones. And the progestogen is primarily to protect the uterus. However, Sonia also presented a report of a study using high-dose um, natural progesterone orally and a reduction in flushing and sweating. But we don't have that medication available uh, in Australia. So we know that, um, oh, I'm getting the five minute that's, that's a bit, I've talked too long. Every time we do these talks, I always go over time. And um, so you'll bear with me, I'll try and be very quick. Um, we know that HRT is really the medication for flushing and sweating in women who are fit and healthy with low risk. And hot flushes will be relieved by about 80% according to the right dosage that you, are, you need you as an individual person need. And that will change from woman to woman. We know that it improves night sweats, so if you're not waking up at night, your sleeping's going to be better, your mood's going to be better, your aches and pains are going to be better. Uh, there is a, from the WHI study 10 years ago, they showed that there was a small reduction in bowel cancer 
and definitely a reduction also in hip fractures. That's the sort of marker for whether a medication works in osteoporosis. Now this was the first time that a study had ever shown that you could reduce fracture rates. We knew that hormones therapy would maintain bone density, but we didn't have the data about uh, the fractures. We know that in fit and healthy women, and this is what's come out this year, 10 years after they produced that study, which basically did not show statistical change, is that there is no significant increase in the risk of heart disease, heart attack, in, and stroke in women who are in the 50 to 59 year old age group. So that's most women who go through the menopausal experience. There was no significant increase in the risk of breast cancer in those women on hormone therapy of estrogen and progesterone under five years. And in fact, in those women on estrogen, there was no increase in the risk of breast cancer after seven years, and 10 years down the track, in those women who were on estrogen alone, there has been shown to be a statistically significant reduction in the risk of breast cancer in that particular group of women. And that was published this year, uh, yes, this year. We know that with any hormone therapy, it doesn't matter whether it's the pill, whether it's HRT, what it is. There is a small, in pregnancy, there is a small increase in risk in thrombosis. So one extra case per 10,000 women per year. It's higher if you're overweight and it's higher if you're older. So once you hit 60, all of the risks of cardiovascular disease, stroke, high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, osteoporosis, thrombosis, you name it, it all goes up, unfortunately. And that's a passage of time. It's got nothing to do with hormones. And we know with one of the side effects of, of combined oestrogen and progesterone can in fact be spotting or bleeding, which usually can be um, improved. This is the oestrogen only study. Now that was published in 2004, and I bet most of you never heard about it. All you heard about the one was the one in 2002, and um, the fact that uh, they, um, they didn't publish that um, uh, data. Uh, in the media didn't pick it up because, in fact, um, it was a good news story. So that showed no increase in, in uh, breast cancer by the end of seven years. There was no increase in heart disease in that group of women. All of these women had had hysterectomies. That's why they were in the oestrogen alone group. And there was a small increase in the risk of thrombosis and stroke. Tibolone, I don't know if any of you know of Livial, but Tibolone is a synthetic therapy. It's been around since the 1980s in Europe and uh, um, the UK. It's a one-stop shop. It has the actions, but is none of them, of oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Um, so it works a bit like each of those. It's good on uh, menopausal symptoms. It doesn't seem to stimulate breast cells as much. It has a different method of action to standard oestrogen and progesterone. It combines another number of different types of action in the body. It's a bit sort of magical, isn't it, really? Um, but what it does do is that there's a particular protein in the body called sex hormone binding globulin. And a lot of, um, a lot of hormones tack onto that, but the one that we're interested in that tacks onto SHBG is testosterone. And remember that testosterone is the third female hormone. It's the first male, but the third female. And so Livial, what Livial does, or Tibolone, is that it reduces SHBG. So it allows more testosterone to flo float around in the system. And that may be one of the reasons why it does improve libido and mood in some women. It has a, a significantly lower risk of thrombosis. Um, and there's been no obvious increase in heart disease and stroke in younger women. So testosterone, well, we have the queen of testosterone here with us, Sonia. Um, she's done so much research on testosterone. So any questions you have about testosterone, you can 
um, direct them to Sonia. But basically there is no testosterone that has been uh, approved by the TGA in Australia and we don't know what the long-term risks of women are uh, for women uh, in the long term, so uh, maybe Sonia can help us with that. And the work that Sonia was involved with um, showed that it didn't matter whether you're, you had normal or uh, high or low testosterone, it didn't necessarily equate to your libido. And um, so loss of libido is multifactorial in women and not just related to testosterone, except perhaps in those women who've had their ovaries out. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, are on or know about bioidentical hormones which are compounded. Um, now, what that means is that these are prescriptions written by a doctor taken to a pharmacy that is compounded and made up from uh, basic biological uh, products, uh, the different types of biological estrogens, progesterone and testosterone. They're not approved of by Canberra. They have not been TGA approved. There is no safety and efficacy data on it. They are not safer. And there are some people out there that we heard at our conference who have been prescribing these to women with breast cancer. They are just another form of hormone replacement therapy. So if, you, if everybody is going to lump every single HRT into one basket, then they have to be lumped into the same basket. Every estrogen that we prescribe, except for Premarin, are bioidentical estrogens. So the normal prescriptive hormone products have all got bioidentical estrogens in them but they are manufactured in a laboratory that looks at quality control and it must have the dose that's required. You cannot say that compounding pharmacies are all across the board going to give you exactly the dose that the prescription says. So I would counsel you to remember it is just another form of HRT. Going to work, but we don't have the, the research on it. Progesterone cream, forget about. It doesn't get absorbed um, and it's a money-making exercise. Yam cream was also promoted as a natural progesterone. In fact, it's an estrogen called diosgenin. That's the main active part in wild yam and it's actually a phytoestrogen. And uh, there have been some products that have been synthesized using diosgenin. Women who go through an early menopause must have HRT, as I said in the beginning, but their doses much, must be much higher. We don't go at starting low and building up, which we would do in somebody who goes through menopause at the expected age. In young women, they need high doses for symptom relief and also to maintain their bone density. Low doses are not necessarily going to be effective. And we cannot equate the literature from WHI published 10 years ago to women who go through an early menopause. We're basically giving hormone therapy to provide them with the hormones that their ovaries would normally have been producing. There has been no studies done and there will never be any other studies on hormone replacement therapy long term because of WHI. Nobody will put the money in to doing a long-term research on the risks and benefits of hormone therapy in any age of women. That, that study has stuffed it for, for everybody. So we can't say that the risk of breast cancer is the same. We expect that the risk of breast cancer in women who go through early menopause equates to those of her, or her age group. So, Deciding about hormone therapy is an individual decision. You need to know about the treatment options. You need to know the benefits and the risk in your individual uh, situation. So what your risk factors are, uh, what your family history is, what your symptoms are like, what your whole circumstances are and how they're going to impact on your experience. Find out what's suitable for you 
how it can be given, all of the things that I've just been talking about. Now, one of the things I haven't said is that 10% of us are going to have symptoms for more than 10 years. So all of the stuff that came out 10 years ago where you should be on the lowest dose for the shortest period of time and not over five years. In fact, the average time that women will have symptoms for, looking at the research done in this city, is eight years. That's the mean time that women will have symptoms for. So five years is, there'll be a whole percentage of women who over, after five years are still going to be symptomatic. So are we meant to go on and suffer our symptoms in silence? The answer is no. No one can tell you how long you need to be on it. It's as long as you're prepared to take it. So how long should I use it? I've gone through all of those. We've talked about complementary therapies. Please, if you're on across-the-counter products, no matter what it is, whether it's a vitamin, a mineral, a herb, tell your GP. Because there are certain herbs that interact with prescriptive therapies, such as St John's wort and being on an antidepressant, being on certain ginsengs and taking blood pressure medications. So I've talked about most of those. So when should you, a woman seek help? when you feel your symptoms are troubling you. And what will trouble one woman and the severity of it is not what another woman will be troubled by. Ask your advice from your GP, your women's health clinic, your women's health nurse. Um, we have a clinic at uh, Jean Hales uh, at Clayton uh, where we have a group of general practitioners uh, who are women's health trained and then there are a group of consultants like myself and Sonia, um, who also work in the area. We have a pelvic floor physiotherapist who's brilliant. We do have a uh, naturopath, Sandra, who's going to be on the webcast. Uh, and we have dietitians, psychologists, um, and we have a great group of people out there. So if, uh, if you're not getting uh, um, help from the people that you think should be helping you, please come and visit one of our GPs. So diary your symptoms, and if you're going on the website, um, if you, for example, put on Australasian Menopause Society, the thing that will come up above it is an ad for the menopause, Australian Menopause Institute or something. Don't even go there, please. Um, don't. <laughs> And if you're worried, get a second opinion. Thank you very much.